Many clubs have played a key role in shaping popular music throughout the years. Cotton Club, Birdland, Cavern Club, Whiskey A Go Go, CBGB. But there's one influential place that you might have never heard of. A place known for its address in Berkeley, California. 924 Gilman Street, the East Bay Mecca of American punk, the home turf of Operation Ivy, the Beatniks, New Roses, Green Day. Hello, top putters and newcomers. This is Simon Mas, your friend with a master degree in music and the story of how a bunch of outsiders and free thinkers created a place that revitalized punk rock in the 1980s. To understand what the opening of Gilman Street meant back in 1987, we need to talk about the local punk scene before that. In San Francisco, punk had turned into hardcore in the early 1980s, a new development that had its fair share of problems. For a start, there was an increase of violence associated with the scene. Fist fights could break out at gigs for reasons as stupid as getting a weird look or spotting someone looking too normal or acting too mellow. The muscular mix of punk and metal, the confrontational tone of the lyrics and the copious amounts of drugs and alcohol consumed the gigs didn't help either. But the truth is that some people were just mad at feeling like the outcasts of the Reagan states of America. The obvious result was that the few venues hosting punk gigs simply stopped doing so. Enough. Enough. But the scene lived on. This music was born out of spite for commercialism and people had got used to doing everything by themselves organizing gigs in someone's garage, producing DIY zines that talked about the bands, releasing influential mixtapes that brought the music to fresh ears. But what about Berkeley? Across the bay, there was much less patience with violence. Young kids would get their copies of Maximum Rock and Roll, Comet Bus or other zines in record shops and read about punk getting a taste for the music. This was a community that put a premium on inclusivity. People wanted to be themselves and be left alone, and they let others be too, however different or loony they were. Now, uh, would you like to continue? They loved punk because the DIY ethics of the scenes gave them a sense of accomplishment and freedom in the face of that middle-class America that was making their life hell. But however much work and love these kids were putting into their projects, in some cases much more than what most people did or do with their paid work, well, they didn't have a place to call home. A number of warehouses host an impromptu punk evening or two, but they were soon shut down afterwards. Garage gigs did go on, but the scene needed a catalyst to take off. In 1986, drummer Kamala Parks and artist Victor Hayden stumbled upon the perfect place, a warehouse in North Berkeley at 924 Gilman Street. But the two didn't have the money to secure the contract. It looked like this was going to be another missed chance. But this is where the hero of our story comes in. Tim Johannan, like Victor Hayden, was an older guy who loved punk and its energy. His zine, Maximum Rock and Roll, first assembled as an insert for a 1982 LP compilation featuring 47 bands of the Bay Area, was one of the most influential punk publications in the States. Hayden called Johannan about the warehouse in Gilman Street. Tim had money and expertise coming from his maximum rock and roll work. It was time to give the East Bay punk community the home it deserved and perhaps something more. Johannan started speaking with as many people as he could. The owner of the warehouse, the local residents. He wanted to understand what concerns they had with the 
punk club opening in the neighborhood so that these could be addressed. Yohanan had a talk with the local authorities too, to make sure the club had all the necessary permits. Only then, finally, he started putting 924 Gilman Street together. When the work started on the venue to set the place up, Johannan opened it to the local punk community. Everyone was welcome to work on their club. For free, of course, but this was not just about saving money. Johannan was bringing his politics to the table. 924 Gilman Street was to be an experiment bringing together the local youth, the neighborhood, and why not? The low. People had to work for free because this was their home. A bit like this community we're building together is the home of every open-minded music lover. But you've got to put in some light work. Drop me a comment to tell me how to improve. Tell your friends about my videos. Or perhaps subscribe to my Telegram channel to keep in touch and get free extras. Link in the description or with this QR code. Imagine, you might even be the hero of the day sending me a small PayPal donation. Thank you. And let's go back to our story. When it came to 924 Gilman Street, every worker was welcome to discuss how the place was going to be set up and run in regular democratic meetings. In all fairness, Johannan did impose some basic rules though. No sexism, no racism, no drugs, no alcohol, no problematic or violent behavior allowed on the premises. It was a different club. If someone didn't have the money to get into a show, they could pay with labor, helping to put up the show, cleaning up the place afterwards, serving at the door on another evening, or doing something else. And so, everyone could become a worker and have a say during the regular meetings to run the club. Kids loved having this responsibility. Many of them, still in high school, never had anyone asking for their opinion. Opened in January 1987, 924 Gilman Street soon became the center of punk activity for the whole East Bay area. And through Kamala Park's contacts, Gilman bands could tap into a continental network of other local punk scenes, which allowed them to tour independently, without promoters or other music business grown-ups. But there were also problems naturally. Not everyone liked how Gilman Street was run. For a start, someone smelled Maoism when attitude adjustment sessions started to be enforced. Sessions to atone for aggressive or inconsiderate behavior that some people displayed. Then, the no drugs or alcohol policy gave the perception of East Bay punks as being joyless, self-serious knobs and it was easily circumvened if one wanted to. The democratic debates could degrade into ideological battles between competing factions. Furthermore, both Gilman and Maximum Rock and Roll, the two brain children of Tim Yohannan, well, they could be really elitist institutions at times and welcoming to different ideas, set in their own ways, acting as gatekeepers more than facilitators. They could be an incredible force for the good of the community, but woe to whoever rubbed the key people the wrong way, as we will see in a future video. But these were minor nuisances. Unfortunately, there was more. But we need to give this more our full attention in the next episode of this story, The Battle for Gilman Street. This, my dear top Hatters, was Simon Mas. Stick around for the continuation of this story and for more music-related videos. It seems there's a Green Day series brewing, but keep it hush. For the moment, stay cool and keep your top hat on. Bye!